This is a big one. Brace yourself. I'm going to talk about the top EV myths I hear about the most often. While that's technically true, it's not taking into account how your fueling pattern changes with an EV. In a gasoline car, you drive until your tank reaches a point that it needs more gasoline, say a quarter tank. Then you make a detour to a gas station and spend five minutes fueling up and then go along your way. If you're an EV owner and have a dedicated parking spot like a garage that has a place to plug in, you can do that every night when you get home. There's no detour, no waiting until you have a quarter tank left, you just plug it in every night or every few nights. The next day when you get up to drive to work or run errands, you have a full tank ready to go. No waiting at gas stations, no fumes, no detours. It's a completely different fueling pattern. Driving long distance might take a little longer, but again, not as much as you might think. For instance, while driving from Boston to upstate New York to visit my parents, which is roughly 380 miles or 611 kilometers, I passed 10 Tesla superchargers. My car has a range of 310 miles fully charged, but let's knock that down to 250 to account for things like cold temperatures or inefficient driving. I'll only need to make one stop during the entire trip to fuel up. And in the 20 years I've been making this drive, in my gasoline cars, we always stop somewhere to eat lunch about halfway into the trip. If we spend 30 to 45 minutes to stop, eat, stretch our legs, and charge at a supercharger, we'll have more than enough to get to my parents' house. Since we've always made food and pit stops like this in the middle of our trip to eat and gas up, there really isn't any change to the total drive time at all. Again, it does take longer than gassing up, but your car can charge without you there, which leaves you to take care of other errands at the same time. The one area where I can gas up in five minutes really starts to gain some real truth is for folks who don't have a dedicated parking spot, like in an apartment building, or they don't have a garage at home, where they can't plug in every single night. This is really for people who park on the street. They need to find alternative ways to power up, and depending on where you live and work, this is something that you'll need to figure out if it can work for you. In my area, many companies have installed EV chargers in their office and business parking lots. So you can charge your car up while you're at work, or you can charge your car while at the grocery store and you're shopping. Again, multitasking that saves you time over a gas station, but it really depends on where you are. There are still areas that may not have widely distributed public EV chargers yet, so street parking EV owners will have a bigger challenge and it may not work well for you day to day. But I think you'll be surprised at how many public stations there actually are, and you can find out by using apps like PlugShare, Open Charge Map, or ChargePoint, and in Europe, Charge Map. And finally, there's increased investment worldwide on building out DC fast charging locations. Many public chargers are either level one or level two AC chargers, which range in charging speeds from a few miles added per hour to 30 plus added per hour. Level two is what you see most often in public locations. With DC fast charging, which is similar to Tesla superchargers, you can get rates of up to nine miles per minute. Those networks are getting built out quickly with over 2000 sites in the United States so far and even more available in Europe. And there are 350 kilowatt fast chargers starting to open up, which can charge around 20 miles per minute. In the United States, the average customer experiences 1.3 power interruptions that account for four hours during the year. And that's including major events that knock the power out. Obviously, your mileage will vary depending on where you live. I don't know anyone that keeps their gas or EV car nearly empty until they need it. So you'd have whatever's in your car when the blackout happens. For most EV owners, that will probably be a fairly full battery. If you're talking about those blackout averages, then there's absolutely nothing to worry about. If you're talking about something more catastrophic where power could be out for days, then everyone will be affected because gas stations may not have power for the gas pumps. In those situations, you wouldn't be driving around like normal, you'd be driving to get to safety and would have to plan accordingly. Again, extremely rare. <laughs> This one is a resounding false from all my research. Many people compare the longevity of their cell phone battery to the longevity of an EV battery, which is apples and oranges. You might notice significant degradation on your phone in a few years, but not so in an EV. They have different battery chemistry, different use cases, and charging patterns. Nissan Leaf taxis have been shown to have 75% of their battery capacity after 120,000 miles or 193,000 kilometers. Tesla's show an even better longevity with 5% loss after 50,000 miles, which is 80,000 kilometers, and another 5% after 150,000 miles, which is about 241,000 kilometers. With the average US driver going about 13,000 miles or 21,000 kilometers per year, and owning a car on average for seven years, you will not even come close to needing to replace the battery on a new car. 
Not to mention that most EVs come with an eight year or 100,000 plus mile warranty on the battery. The average usable lifespan of a battery will extend way beyond that point. But how much does it cost to replace a battery? In 2012, it was reported that a Tesla Model S 85 kilowatt hour battery cost $12,000 to replace. However, lithium ion battery price per kilowatt hour has been declining rapidly from about $400 per kilowatt hour in 2012 to around $150 per kilowatt hour. Tesla has publicly stated that it's trying to get to $100 per kilowatt hour very soon, which will drive the battery pack price down even further. Given how quickly the prices are dropping and the fact that you wouldn't have to worry about an out of warranty battery for eight years, the cost isn't gonna be anything to worry about when you project prices out eight or more years from now. This one is complex because there's a little truth to those statements, but they're completely out of context. You need to look at the full life cycle of a car from manufacturing to use to disposal. Let's start with manufacturing. The Union of Concerned Scientists completed a thorough study that showed 84 mile range EVs result in about 15% more emissions during manufacturing than a gasoline vehicle. And a 250 mile range EV comes in around 68% in higher emissions. It all comes down to the size of the battery pack. As crazy as that 68% higher may sound, it's quickly overshadowed by a gasoline car as soon as it's driven off the lot. Well, not right off the lot, but within 18 months of driving. The EV will result in 53% lower overall emissions compared to a similar gasoline car. So how do we get to that 53%? That's where we look at the well-to-wheel emissions, which accounts for extraction, processing, and distribution of the primary energy sources that the vehicles use. All of this really comes down to your electricity source, which is fairly easy to find out if you don't already know. Depending on where you live, this can change drastically. Looking at the data from the US Department of Energy, in Massachusetts we're 69% natural gas, 16% nuclear, 8% renewable, which is solar, hydro, and wind, and 4% coal. And there are a few other things that round it out to 100%. A gasoline car produces 11,435 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent each year, versus an EV in Massachusetts at 3,533 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent each year. If you take a step back and you look at the national average, EVs step up slightly to 4,453 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, move to a state like Missouri, which is 80% coal, and EVs produce 8,135 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Still better than gasoline cars, but nothing close to what we're seeing in states like California, which is 1,974 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent for each EV per year. Even a purely coal electricity driven EV will pollute less than an average conventional gasoline car over its lifespan. It's the emissions saved from using the car day to day that pull EVs way ahead of gasoline cars. And as more states and countries move into cleaner electricity, those numbers will continue to improve over time. Norway is nearly 100% renewable energy right now. And some surveys have shown that between 28 and 40% of EV owners have solar panels on their homes, like I do. And finally, the end of life of these cars. Lithium ion batteries can be recycled, which will keep hazardous materials from entering the waste system. Some car companies like Renault with their Zoe EV in Europe are taking degraded batteries and repurposing them into their whole home battery systems. Tesla already has partners for recycling spent battery cells, but is planning on building out its own internal recycling system to make all of their gigafactories closed loop systems. It's not only good for the environment, but it also makes financial sense because they can recoup a lot of different valuable materials without having to dig for more. In the end, both gasoline and EVs put out just under one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent during disposal. The U.S. Department of Transportation shows that Americans drive an average of less than 40 miles or 64 kilometers per day. A Nissan Leaf has a range of around 150 miles or 240 kilometers. A Chevy Bolt is around 200 miles or 320 kilometers. And the long-range Tesla Model 3 is around 300 miles or 480 kilometers. Any of those EVs are more than enough for your daily drive without any worry of range. And as I mentioned before, if you're plugging in at the end of the day, you never have to worry about range the following day either. But what about longer range trips? Well, according to data from the good old Department of Transportation here in the US again, 98% of single trip journeys were under 50 miles. Trips over 70 miles in length account for just 1% of all single trip journeys. And if we account for more rural travelers who drive longer distances than urban travelers, it's still 95% of all trips being under 50 miles. And when looking at all those drivers and the average round trips, 93% drive less than 100 miles round trip per day. 
For the more rare, generally long-range trips, which I do myself a couple of times a year, something like a Nissan Leaf may not be practical. Fast charging locations off a highway might be able to charge you up in 30 to 60 minutes, but with a range of 150 miles, you'd be stopping for 30 or more minutes every 125 miles. If I were driving to my parents' house, which is roughly 380 miles away, I'd be stopping three times in a Leaf. But with cars like a Tesla Model 3, Chevy Bolt, or the upcoming Hyundai Kona, I'd be stopping once. That's the same number of stops and the same length of a stop as I would do in a gas car. And if you combine EVs longer ranges we're seeing today with the faster charging networks being rolled out, this is even less of a problem. Yes, right now EVs are more expensive up front, and yes, many EVs on the market are in the more luxury price point, at least for right now. But that's changing quickly. This is always how new technology and manufacturing works. In the beginning, it's very expensive to produce, which means the luxury markets tend to get access to new, cool tech first. As manufacturing yields better results and efficiencies are made, they can produce more for less cost per unit, which drives the cost down and out of the luxury market. Tesla is transitioning through this phase right now with the Model 3. Their first cars would run you close to six figures, but today they're edging closer and closer to the target of $35,000 for the short range Model 3. The Chevy Bolt already is available for around $30,000 and can sometimes be found for less. The Hyundai Kona, a CUV that I'm genuinely excited for, is due out next year here in the US for $36,000. With or without tax rebates, EVs are rapidly hitting prices that the average consumer can afford. In a couple of years, we may be seeing cars in the mid $20,000 range, which is where the upcoming VW ID Neo is rumored to be. And that's not even mentioning the used market that will grow over time. An EV in the United States on average costs half as much to run as an equivalent gasoline car. Based on a University of Michigan study, they found EVs to cost roughly $485 per year versus $1,117 for gas. Electricity prices tend to be more stable and easier to project over time than gasoline prices, which can fluctuate wildly. Being more predictable makes EVs easier to budget for. Then there's the maintenance costs. With fewer moving parts, exhaust systems, less wear on brakes, smaller and more efficient cooling systems, no oil, no engine air filters, timing belts, I think you get the idea. The cost of maintaining an EV is lower than a gasoline car too. How much less? That's very hard to estimate right now given the wide variety of gasoline cars and their reliability, but it is less. Now will you come out ahead versus a gasoline powered car? It depends on what cars you're looking at. Comparing a Tesla Model 3 long-range all-wheel drive to a Toyota Camry isn't exactly apples to apples, but if you're looking at spending about $30,000 on a car regardless of the type of engine, then you can easily say a $30,000 EV will cost you less than a $30,000 gasoline car over time. But it all comes down to whether or not that $30,000 EV has the looks, features, and build quality that you want. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.